And the truth is, today's results are the impact of yesterday's decisions. Tomorrow's results will be the impact of today's decisions. To create a breakthrough in our results, we must have a breakthrough in our decisions. Hey, what's up, everybody? Doran Aldana here coming at you with another kick-ass episode of the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. And today we're going to talk about the top five decision-making habits of top producers. What do those look like and how can they make a difference in your leadership and in your impact in your mortgage business? Why bother studying and emulating the decision-making patterns of top producers, you might be thinking? Well, obviously, the quality of our decisions determine the quality of our life, true or not true, right? We often make wrong decisions, do we not? We operate based on habit force and our own subconscious programming, much of which is malformed and misinformed from our past, from our parents, from our parents' parents. You know, the generational dysfunction that we see passing from generation to generation. So a lot of our habits aren't even intelligently crafted and designed, are they? We just run on an autopilot paradigm. We eat too much ice cream, not enough salad, right? Sleeping instead of exercising, drinking alcohol instead of drinking water or some kind of beverage that's more beneficial and invigorating and purifying and health inducing. We fight with the spouse instead of being humble, gentle, and loving. We push paper across our desk instead of prospecting and filling our pipeline with new prospects, new partners, new leads. We drift versus drive. Have you noticed? Now, the cumulative effect of our daily decisions compound to determine our destiny. It doesn't happen in a day. It happens daily to our daily decisions, either consciously or unconsciously. Our goal is to be conscious, to be aware, to forge our path with purposeful intention. And the truth is, today's results are the impact of yesterday's decisions, right? Tomorrow's results will be the impact of today's decisions. To create a breakthrough in our results, we must have a breakthrough in our decisions. And our level of problem solving will never exceed our level of decision making. So we may have champion level dreams, right? Champion level ambitions. But if we have chump level decision making, we got a problem, right? We got to get those aligned. So, with that in mind, here are the top five decision making habits of top producers. Habit number one they have decisiveness with discernment. You're going to notice as I frame these habits, they all have a paradox, a polarity, a duality where they seem contradictory, but in truth, they create a healthy balance between a polarity of the light, the darkness, the cold, and the hot, the high and the low. There's a duality of the qualities and characteristics of high-level leadership you're going to hear in each one of these habits of decision-making. So the first one is decisiveness with discernment. They don't just make decisions on the fly without having discernment being part of those decisions. They don't just mindlessly pull the trigger. They're discerning about what target they want to hit and making sure they're pulling the trigger in the right direction that's most strategically advantageous. You see, procrastination, if we're not decisive, we tend to procrastinate, right? We tend to delay and deliberate. And truth be told, procrastination is the number one killer of progress. No decision is still a decision. We can think that we can delay a decision till tomorrow, and we certainly can if it's strategically advantageous to do so. But no decision is still a decision. And oftentimes, our procrastination just pushes the ball down the field a little bit to buy us a little more time but we're missing the power and the progress that comes from making the decision until we make the decision. 
slow decision-making rarely leads to fast results. So for example, we may ha- have some type of a impression or an internal nudge or a thought or an inspiration that just flashes across the screen of our mind and we think, oh, I need to do that. Then we don't strike while the iron is hot. We don't pick up the phone. We don't gaff it with a pen. We don't write it down. We don't put it in the calendar. We miss the magic of the moment. We could have struck while the iron was hot, but we missed it. And now the iron has gotten cold and that window of opportunity is slammed shut because we deliberated, we procrastinated, and that moment of of opportunity now has been missed. So one of the things you'll notice about top producers in their decision-making is they get all the data necessary to make those important big decisions. They're not going to just fly off the handle. They're not just going to make a decision without getting the data first, because that, that would be like doing archery blind. That would not make sense. But then they pull the trigger. They make a decision to make a decision. Top producers make decisions quickly and go back on them slowly. That's what leadership looks like. You'll never see a, an elite leader who is slow to making decisions. Phil McGraw had a great point when he said, sometimes you make the right decision. Sometimes you make the decision right. So it's not about seeking perfection. Perfectionism is the lowest standard. We seek progress. And sometimes that progress means, hey, I could have made a better decision had I known then what I know now. I could have made a better decision. I just didn't know what I didn't know. So now I'm going to make the decision right by reiterating by shifting, by being flexible, by pivoting, by innovating, by problem solving, and having too much grit to quit to find a solution. I made the wrong decision, but now I'm going to do whatever it takes to make that wrong decision right. That is part of what it looks like to be a leader, to be a elite top producer is about being a leader first and foremost of yourself. And then, of course, as you build your team, leading others. So that's the first habit. The second habit of decision-making of top producers is ambition with prudence. Notice the duality. Ambition, right? To achieve, to accomplish, to take ground, to build the empire, to build the dream team, to accomplish massive impact in the world. That's ambition. But then there's prudence, there's frugality, there's a certain degree of feet in the street, feet on the ground, realism, not just pie in the sky dreaming. There's feet on the ground, realism, there's prudence, there's frugality. The prudent and frugal to prune back unnecessary or low yielding expenses that are not producing much fruit. And yet they will swing for the fences with big, bold, strategic investments in their growth. Sometimes tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars are invested in strategic growth because they have ambition, but they also have an anchoring of realism, frugality, and prudence when it comes to profitability, when it comes to watching their KPIs and their numbers. So it's that duality of ambition and prudence. Even if they're, they've made errors in judgment in the past, they don't let that dampen their ambition. They don't let that you know, cause them to be jaded. They learn from their mistakes so they can start again more intelligently. It's not a failure. It's just feedback. Another opportunity to start again more intelligently. If they get once bitten, twice shy, or twice bitten, thrice shy, by making a faulty decision or a failed investment, for example, they don't let themselves get jaded and cynical about it. They realize the only way to turn those lemons into lemonade is to finally make the right decision so they can turn those lemons into lemonade with the sugar of success. Without that sugar of success, it's just sour in their mouth. It's a sour finish. And as the late great Shakespeare once said, all is well that's, that ends well. So 
finishing with a sweet satisfaction of success. Turning the lemons into lemonade is what it's all about. So you can't win the game of life, the game of business, by playing defense alone, can you? You can't win just by playing defense alone, by playing turtle, by hiding under the shell, by being once bitten, twice shy, licking your wounds, feeling sorry for yourself. You can't win by playing defense alone, which is why top producers are more committed to making the right decision than they are to avoiding making the wrong decision. You get that. There needs to be some offense, not just defense. And it's mission critical that we understand that because if we don't, what happens is we start playing safe, playing small, and playing to our defenses too much, and we can't win the game of life. We can't win the game of business playing defense alone. We also must play offense. So before making a significant investment, top producers will ask questions like this. Is this investment in alignment with my strategic objectives? Is it going to help me get to my desired outcomes better, faster, easier, more expediently? For example, will it help me get more referrals? Will it help me get more repeat business? Will it help me get more rave reviews? Will it help raise my revenue? Right? Those are strategic outcomes. Now, if you're looking at, for example, wanting to raise your income, you can do it strategically by investing in leads, for example, where you're sifting through a mountain of gravel just to find a few gold nuggets. Someone else is doing the heavy lifting for you by doing the lead generation activity. And you're going to have to burn and churn through a lot of chaff just to find a few gold nuggets. That's one option in terms of strategic investment. But does it align with your strategy of working less and earning more? Probably not. You're going to have to work more and earn less because it's cutting into your margins. You're going to have to be on the phone all day. You're going to have to be a phone monkey calling these leads that don't pick up. Most of them are not going to qualify. Most of them don't have sufficient income or credit. So you're going to have to sift through a mountain of gravel just to find a few gold nuggets. That's called doing it the hard way versus making a strategic investment to get the best quality borrowers all by referral through top producing realtors who send you all their business all the time. That's what we're all about here on Planet Prosper is working smart as opposed to just working hard. There's no brownie points at the bank for doing it the hard way, right? You might as well use the excavator, not the shovel. If you're going to have to dig, you might as well use the excavator, not the shovel. So another great question, strategic question that top producers will ask is, will the investment, for example, if we're thinking inside of the uh, decision around investment, will the investment give me a positive return on investment in the next two to four months with a modest level of success? In other words, it doesn't have to be knocking out of the park like home run to make a positive return on investment, just a modest level of success, a modest level of traction, a modest level of progress in this particular pathway. If it was just a modest level of success, would I get a return, positive return on my investment within a relatively short period of time, namely two to four months? If the answer is yes, then that's a relatively low risk value proposition. It's a relatively low risk strategic opportunity, right? Another question to ask is, what's the worst that could happen? Well, the worst that could happen is I lose money, I waste money, I waste time, right? That's certainly something we want to avoid, wasting time, wasting money. In order to make progress, we got to utilize the resources we have with the best yield, with the highest return to get the greatest outcome from the least amount of input. So we want to avoid the landmine and the suck of wasting time and money for obvious reasons. But if the worst that can happen is like, hey, I might get one deal and I double my money, well, that's not really a super low risk scenario, right? It's, or rather, it's not a super high risk scenario. It's relatively low risk. So Thinking worst case scenarios can help you to determine, is it a risk worth taking? Another strategic question top producers might ask is, what's the best that could happen? Not just what's the worst 
that can happen. But more importantly, what's the best that could happen? Doubling, tripling, quadrupling, quintupling my income within three, four, six, 12 months, right? Working smarter, not harder, more quality time with the family, more vacations, more freedom, more peace of mind, more consistency that allows me to have peace and be in the driver's seat versus being in the passenger seat, driving versus drifting. Those are the sorts of things that are on the other side of success when the best happens versus the worst. So obviously, you're not going to have the juice of the sweet satisfaction of success unless you're willing to take some degree of risk. There is no reward without risk. And for top producers, the better, the bigger risk is not you know, swinging for the fences and failing. The biggest risk is not even trying, being a slave to their fear, having the dark cloud of I could have, would have, should have, but I didn't, regret prison, knowing they could have taken action, but they didn't, knowing they could have rolled out the tanks, but they were showing up to the gunfight with a butter knife, knowing they should have and could have upgraded to the excavator but they settled for the shovel. Knowing they could have pressed the P button on the elevator and went straight to making prosperity money, but instead they had to grind up the 100-story staircase with a 50-pound with backpack because they chose to play it safe and play it small. So the risk is usually higher in not taking action. There's usually a higher risk in the mind of a top producer in not swinging for the fences by playing safe, playing small, and playing to their comfort zone. So top producers have a strong propensity and proclivity to stepping outside of their comfort zone, swinging for the fences, and being strategically ambitious and embracing and taking strategic risks that will get them higher rewards because there is no reward without risk. The new risk is not taking risks. The new risky is not taking risks. Try that one on for size. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. The new risk is not taking risks. Because then you're just stuck in the parking lot with the emergency brake on, stay, stuck in half, you know, throttle, idling, and not moving forward. Another question you want to ask that is in line with the mindset and the strategic pathway that top producers take is. Is the reward worth the risk? Is the reward worth the upside? Uh, or rather, is the upside worth the risk in this particular decision? If the answer is yes, screw it, let's do it. That's how champions roll. If the answer is no, how can I mitigate the risk and optimize the reward? What can I do to tip the scales of fortune in my favor so I minimize the risk and maximize the reward? Those are Again, strategic questions the top producers will ask. Another question is, is the risk manageable? Is it something I can influence? Is it something that I can mitigate, right? And if we can mitigate the risk, we can never completely avoid risk. There's always going to be some component of risk, but can we mitigate it? If it's manageable and if it's something we can mitigate, then it behooves us to do so because that will increase the odds of the reward while also minimizing the chance of stepping on the landmines in the process. What can I do to reduce the risk? Oftentimes, reducing risk means being strategic in how we roll out our battle plan. And some of the things we'll talk about as we proceed in this session in terms of getting the right counsel, the right advice. And then, of course, once we have the right counsel, the right advice, and a proven formula recipe blueprint, and we know that we've got a proven pathway to prosperity or a proven pathway to our strategic outcomes, then it's a matter of cutting bait and going all in. Because all in is the only way to win. We don't want to half-ass, we want to full-ass because all in is the only way to win. And oftentimes, we increase the risk of failure by being so riddled with fear about failing that we never go all in. We half step, we pull punches, we don't show up with confidence, we don't show it up, up with certainty, we wobble. We wobble in our execution because we're riddled with self-doubt, with imposter syndrome, 
we're not all in committed. We're divided in our attentions, our focuses. We are, you know, death by a million razor cuts with all these things that distract us from scrolling on social media to being reactionary to inbound calls, inbound text messages, inbound emails. And we're living in reactionary mode where someone else is initiating all the things we're doing that we're reacting to other people's outbound calls, emails, text messages, and we're being towed around by the nose by someone else's prerogatives. We don't have any sacred space in our calendar to plan our work, work our plan, and be strategic about high income producing activities, high impact producing activities. And if we're half ass on the high impact, then we'll be full ass on low impact. And that's not what we want. We want to be full ass on high impact, not the other way around. So the third habit of top producers when it comes to decision making is confidence with humility. Confidence with humility. Notice the duality there once again. They are humble enough to ask questions, to get feedback, to seek wise counsel, to ask for advice. As it says in Proverbs 24, 5 to 6, chapter 24, verse 5 to 6, a wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Asking for help is not weakness, it's wisdom. Oftentimes, we get that misconstrued and think that I need to be self-reliant. I need to go full-blown John Wayne on that bad boy, and I need to do everything myself. I need to be self-sufficient and self-reliant, and that's folly. That's foolishness. It's not weakness to ask for help. It's wisdom. Top producers are never too cool for school. The real top producers that are always growing and expanding stepping into the best version of themselves versus stagnating and growing rot, rot of the soul, they're humble enough to know that they're never too cool for school. They're always wanting to learn and grow. They know that's the spot where all the good stuff pours out. They never want to be the smartest guy or gal in the room. They intentionally and strategically surround themselves with people who are smarter than themselves. This is something that I have failed at in my career that would have propelled me to much higher heights, so much faster, if I had been strategic and humble enough to get wise counsel, people who are smarter than me in their zones of genius that can help me condense decades into days by learning from their mistakes so I don't have to. I made way too many mistakes, way too much time wasted, Way too much potential left on the table because I was not humble enough to ask questions, to seek wise counsel, to get advice from other people who have specialized knowledge where I am weak, they are unique. That would have propelled me so much faster, so much quicker. And of course, you know, I'm passing this on to you so you don't have to make that mistake that I made. Now, once top producers make the decision, whatever that decision might be, They move forward confidently. They have one less thing to worry about now. Once they've checked that thing off the list, the to-do list, the the to-decide list, they take action and they make bold progress towards whatever it is they decided to do. They take action. It's time to move forward. And they're going all in on that decision. They don't wobble. They're all in on that decision. So some questions that they might ask inside of this habit is, who can I trust to provide me with wise counsel in this area? Who is unique where I am weak? Who has specialized knowledge in this area? Who already is producing the results I want to have who I can emulate? I can model their formula, their recipe. Who's already spent the time, energy, and money so I don't have to? Those are all great strategic questions. Now, habit number four in top producer habits of decision-making is they think logically, but they trust their gut. 
They use their head, but they're also listening to their heart. They use common sense and critically think around discerning truth from lies, relevancy from irrelevancy, what's vital versus inconsequential or trivial. So they're parsing out what really is important. What is it they need to focus on? What is it that really matters? They trust their intuition, their gut. If something doesn't feel right, they listen to it. They know that that's usually wisdom talking, but they don't make decisions solely by their emotions either. They allow hunches, gut instinct. Some might call it that God sense or that sixth sense to weigh in on their decision-making process. They don't put the blinders on and block it out. They don't say, ah, I'm not an emotional person and block those impressions. They listen to those impressions. Oftentimes, our subconscious mind gives us information we wouldn't get any other way through any other pathway through our conscious cognition. It has to come through our gut, through that sixth sense, through that sense of intuition. But it only can be used, that wisdom can only be used if we listen to it. Last but certainly not least, habit not number five in top producer habits of decision making is that they have urgency, but with patience. Urgency, but with patience. They have a strong bias to strike while the iron is hot in that window of opportunity. They don't want to belabor it. They don't want to procrastinate or delay on it too long. They know there's a window of opportunity to strike while the iron is hot. Their motto is, Why put off for tomorrow what I can do today? But yet they're patient when it comes to seeing the results from their decisions, seeing the harvest from their decisions. They prioritize the highest impact decisions first and then delete and or delegate the low impact decisions. There's some things that we should just be deleting because it's a complete waste of time and energy, like scrolling on social media. Like the best thing I ever did was get apps for that stuff, block it out so that I couldn't be a crack addicted rat scrolling mindlessly on social media. There's a great app called Facebook Newsfeed Eradicator. Best thing that ever happened to me on social media. Facebook Newsfeed Eradicator. Now I use Facebook as a marketing tool, but I'm no longer being the tool being used. And there's a big difference between being used as the tool versus using the tool to produce strategic outcomes. I'm sure you would agree. There's another great app called BlockSite for your smartphone. BlockSite. It blocks any websites that you don't want to be using. Okay, BlockSite. So definitely recommend that as well. It's all about delegating strategically. And it's about making sure you're working on your business, not just in your business, okay? It's all about getting to those outcomes. And it's really about slower results today for faster results tomorrow. They would rather say no to the good opportunities so they can say yes to the great opportunities. They would rather say no to profits in the short term so they can have peace and joy in the long term and peace, more importantly, in the short term as well. They understand there's no amount of success outside the home that makes up for failure inside the home. They will never compromise on their integrity for expediency. They play the long game, but with a sense of urgency. It's all about seizing the day. So those are the habits of top-producing decisiveness, top-producing decision-making. Make sure you apply that to your business. Apply it to your life. What habit? do you need to hem up the most? Where are you weakest at? Where do you need to strengthen when it comes to the habits that I've just shared with you? Which one do you need to focus on the most? Put that as your focus for the next quarter and let's build up momentum. It doesn't happen in a day. It happens daily. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to book a call to learn how you can TEDx your closings, In half the time, working smarter, not harder, book a call at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply.
Again, that's mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. My name is Doran Aldana coming at you from the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. Be blessed. We'll see you again very, very soon. Don't just get to your goals. Let's grow to your goals. See you soon, guys. Peace, y'all. Thanks for being with us.